Hi, everyone. This is Gary. I hope you're well. Welcome to this week's live Path to Prosperity webinar. Welcome to all of the uh, investor agent students, training program students. For those of you who are in a flipping program, um, flipping for profits without the risk, uh, the rental program, rental profits without the pain, wholesaling, wholesaling for profits so everybody wins, and property management, turning rental problems in the real estate profits. Uh, I'm going to turn on my screen here. So hang on one second. Excuse me, turn on my camera. So everybody should be able to see me now. Okay. And get this the view of the ceiling. How about that? Uh, let me go to some of the content we're going to go over tonight. So uh, first things first, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. So hang on one second. Let me make sure uh, everybody can see me and hear me. So I'm going to send you my weekly message. Can you see my screen and hear my voice? So if, uh, if each of you could go ahead and respond to that in your question box, I would really appreciate it. Um, all right, good. We got the – so far, everybody is okay. Uh, let me check the attendee list real quick. <clears throat> so what's interesting, guys, is <laughs> we are live and actually we're recording. Used to be we were live, and then <clears throat> I would initiate the recording after everybody had logged in, but they changed the platform, so it's actually recording now. So we're live and we're recording. Um, looks like we've got uh, some some veterans here and some new people. Welcome to everybody, to all the veteran agents and investors and all the new the new folks on board. Welcome aboard. Hey, Kate, how you doing? See, we got some brand new uh, mastermind members are. Tom, hey, Tom, Daryl. Um, excellent. This is really good, okay? Uh, so what we're going to do tonight, guys, is this. We're going to, uh, Daryl asked if we can talk about how do we actually do a CMA for rental properties? How do we actually uh, compare one rental to another? Uh, by using comparables and it's a good question because he probably discovered that it's not as easy as doing that as it is for doing a cma for single family homes it's just com two completely different animals so we're going to talk about that and then we're gonna also since we're on the subject uh, in rentals i've been looking back at the the last uh sessions guys rentals anything having to do with rentals investing uh managing it's literally been dominating our subject since january 1 when I look back at all the webinars, I just did this earlier. Uh, we've had more webinars related to the subject of rentals than any other subject. <laughs> How about that? Um, so in any case, uh, excellent subject. And I thought since we're on the subject, I'll go ahead and once we go over what Daryl wants to go over, we're going to jump into some commercial information. Um, now, up until now, everything we talked about has been predominantly associated with anything up to and including four units, okay, which is by definition considered residential still. Anything five units and above in the in the in the uh, residential world, even though it's uh, residential, five and above is considered commercial. Anything that's non-residential is already in the commercial world. So we're going to be focusing more on the residential properties in tonight's webinar. Even when we get into the commercial end of things, I'm just going to go into some basics tonight. The reason is, is that's an entirely different subject um, that we do have a lot of material on. And over time, I'll roll it out. We, we I did just finish the sixth book. The sixth book does include a large, giant section on commercial. We will likely spin that off and make its own separate book just on that with uh, more examples and, and uh, life stories and things like that. <clears throat> Within the context of the sixth book, though, it's all basically just academic. So I'm going to touch on that tonight just to give you enough to show you um, some information that you can use today. OK, um, but before we do, if anybody has any questions, uh, if you could go ahead and type them in. We want to make sure we cover any and all questions that are that have been pent up in the last week. We'll cover those and then we'll get into the subject. So uh, uh, let's see here. Um, we're caught up. Everybody is OK so far. Um, all right. Hey, hey Daryl, did you get my email back? By the way, I sent an email back to you earlier regarding that property, uh, the $4.2 million property you have up in New Jersey. Interesting, the, the agent is from an office I taught at out in Bethlehem. <laughs> um, in any case, guys, uh, real quick, just some basic housekeeping, then we'll move into the content. 
For those of you who are new to this, you'll recognize that by default, you're in mute mode, okay? And that's because we can't have 100 people uh, actively of, of live audio at the same time. It just wouldn't work. Um, however, you can use the question box to type in your questions, okay? And sometimes I actually do unmute you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. If there's something um, that I believe uh, would lend itself to, to me unmuting you, and then everybody will hear the conversation, okay? I could even turn it on so you can turn your camera on also, and they can see both of us, as well as have my screen as a background, okay? Uh, also, make sure the next day, which is tomorrow, will be, in this case, a Tuesday, always look for the email from Beverly that contains the recording of this webinar. She also gives you valuable updates to the um, training platform, the members area, um, community site, as well as content. We have content updates from time to time, okay? It uh, seems like we do that almost on a monthly basis. Um, so you want to get the email because she also gives you the upcoming schedule, the webinar schedule, um, and any other relevant or pertinent information related to any of the programs and or the material. Um, some of you are, are in the membership level only, you're, you're a server level member, which we all are by default, but some of you are not in training. Um, you still have access to the members area, which is what that's all about. You can still use some of the tools. I trust you don't get the strategy calls, and uh, I don't even think she gives you the recordings. Unfortunately, you do get this live version here. Uh, there's a game of all the server level membership. Remember, you got a lot of tools there, and all of the, the, the database to give you content and information on where you are, US and Canada, both. Okay. You also get the, the original Word documents for marketing campaigns, for spreadsheets, all that you get on. Um, not to mention the two new things we added this year, which is number one, the cash buyers report. So you have the cash buyers are in your area, including contact information and their private lenders report, which shows you who's lending money privately, not traditional banks and not hard money lenders. I mean, some private lenders are also hard money lenders, but what we like the ones who are just lending on a case by case basis based on the merit of the project. So you get all that. You guys should definitely take advantage of that. Um, it's out there for you, okay? Um, so I think I just saw a question pop in here. Hang on one second. Um, okay, do you have a section on RDA or similar? Uh, this is, uh, hey, Myrna, Myrna, if you could fill me in what you mean by RDA, um, I would really appreciate also for the other people on the webinar here. Um, let's see, Deepwin, hey, Deepwin, how you doing, buddy? Um, so, Myrna, if you could type in and I'll, I'll give you a, a develop a redevelopment land. Um, there's a couple things here, Myrna, a couple categories, guys. Um, there's a term called CRA, Community Reinvestment Act, that generally applies to um, certain areas. And, okay, so, for example, a borough or township could be considered a CRA area. They could also be neighborhoods, not an entire town or city, but just a certain neighborhood in an area, in a town or city could be deemed CRA. Within that uh, framework, um, they, there's also like land reclamation or reclaiming land to redevelop it. And a lot of times that means they're tearing down buildings and building new. And that happened, that's happening more and more, definitely around the US and even, even sometimes up in Canada too. Um, so Myrna, tonight what we'll do is let's say that for, a different night because tonight we've got a pretty full slate but that does fall within the commercial world or can fall in with the commercial world um you know what they're looking to do is improve the land so a building is considered an improvement on the upon the land the land is the land and the building is an improvement upon the land that's the technical definition generally what they're doing when we're doing redevelopment is um we're raising the overall value and scope of that of that land okay we're reclaiming it and put it back out in service for use at a higher purpose okay that's the term we use what calls the highest and best use highest and best use is what we're always striving for whether us as individuals like investors um but more importantly the um uh the folks like like uh typically they're politicians but really you know city managers uh the folks that are basically in charge of of running a city they're always looking for highest and best use, not just because it's the right thing to do, but quite frankly, they get more tax dollars out of it. So, um, so Myrna, if you have specific examples, um, shoot them to me in an email. We'll use another webinar to go over that. 
But for tonight, what I'd like to do is first go over Daryl's question. Um, how can we do a proper CMA for rental properties? So what I want to do to start with is go back to our Excel spreadsheet that we use for the rental property evaluator. Okay? Um, and use this as an example to, to work from. As you can see, uh, this one is already actually spread out. Okay. Um, hey guys, hang on one second. I'm uh, I'm getting some signals here that my webcam is chewing up too much memory. Um, if it, if it does it again, I'll turn my webcam off. I apologize. I know people have said, please turn on your webcam. Uh, so that's why we've been using that. Okay. Everything looks like it's okay right now. All right. This Excel spreadsheet, guys, it gives us a great platform upon which to answer Daryl's question. Okay. So a couple of things here. Um, let's say you've got a, a seven unit building and in your area, you're not finding any other seven unit buildings. It's, it's okay. One of the first things you can do is look at other properties that might have five units, that might have seven units, okay? All we're going to do is break it down to the unit level, okay? In other words, uh, we figure out the cost or the value at the unit level. And then all you do is you use simple math. So if you have a five-unit building that, that on paper looks like it's worth $500,000 and it's been bought and sold at $500,000, so you've got evidence that it is worth $500,000, and your subject property is seven units, all you do is you figure out the for the five-unit building, what is the cost per unit? So, Daryl, make sure you're taking uh, notes on this. What is the cost per unit of the properties that you do have evidence on, in this example, a five-unit building? And if it turns out it's 100000 per unit, then all of the things not being considered at this point, what that means is you can you can assume that at this at the seven unit building, if you apply that that number one hundred thousand per unit, then that building is probably worth seven hundred thousand. Now there's more to it than that, Daryl, and everybody here watching. You have to also make sure that the, the two buildings are similar in, in age, similar in construction. Like you wouldn't want to compare an all brick building with a building that's um, you know uh, clapboard siding, something like that. You can do that. It's just you have to keep making adjustments. In other words, a, a clapboard side building is not worth the same as a as an all brick building. Okay, so you have to make adjustments for the differences in construction. You also have to look at the size of the individual units. How many bedrooms? In other words, just because we said building A is worth five hundred thousand, therefore building B at seven units is worth seven hundred thousand. You know, we have to look at the individual units. So if building A, the one that we can see, has been demonstrated that it is worth 500000 because it recently sold, we have to look at the number of bedrooms per unit, okay, and the square footage, and then take that over to the seven-unit building. So in other words, if the five-unit building has nothing but three-bedroom units, every, every unit has three bedrooms for a total of 15 bedrooms, and you go to the, to the seven-unit building, and those are all two-bedroom units, for a total of 14 bedrooms, that's not a valid comparison. If you do make the comparison, you also have to do make adjustments. These are all things appraisers do, okay? They make adjustments based on the number of bedrooms and based on square footage. Now, most of you know, as well as I do, because you're all investors and agents or both, is that in, appraisers generally do not like to make adjustments when it comes to numbers of bedrooms. They like to have properties that at least have the same numbers of bedrooms per unit okay because that's a tough adjustment to make and boy if you don't get it right you can you can you know, sure cause some some headaches so so the number of bedrooms is critically important and the square footage of the units is also critically important um the, the other thing too is this um let's say your area is just short on multi units most people believe that we, in order to do proper appraisals, we have to be in the same area. And that is fundamentally true. That's what we want to do. But when you can't do that, you can go outside the area. Now, what we do is this. <clears throat> we look for other areas that are homogenous with the subject area. So in other words, you might be in a different town. You might be in a different county. Um, I've never seen anybody be in, in different states, but I've seen them done with different towns and different counties. If you have an area that's similar to the subject property area, you can then compare properties in the two areas. So, Daryl, you can also do that. 
in New Jersey, New Jersey is a very interesting state. You've got southern New Jersey. It's more rural. And then off to the coast, you've got some great beaches, of course. Central New Jersey to the west, you, you're surrounded. You, you're surrounding Philadelphia. So you've got some high density population areas that are really part of the greater the met, greater Philly metro area. Then you go up way up far north. You've got you've got northern New Jersey. It actually goes up above and wraps around the, the, the other side of the river from New York City. OK. Definitely completely different in southern New Jersey. So you do have to make sure you choose areas that are similar. OK. Um, that's one of the things you can do. So, Daryl, uh, what I would recommend is if you're looking at subject properties and you can get information like numbers of bedrooms, square footage, if possible, the age of the property, the type of construction and the number of bedrooms per unit. Um, and you need that at, at a per unit level, by the way. Um, you can then you can then look for properties that are similar, even if they're in different areas, as long as the areas are similar. And that, my friend, is how you can do a really good CMA on some rental properties. And if you have examples, um, I'm going to be glad. I will be glad to look at examples, guys, or bring examples up here on the computer if you have them, or we can do it on a different session. Um, but that that's really that's really the what we have to do. And just imagine this: the larger we get in number, and when we look at buildings, and there's more units per building, like 100 units, 300 units, it becomes far more difficult to do valuations, and you, we have to use techniques just like this. So let me do a quick pause, uh, and I'm going to check for questions here. Hang on one second. So let's see what kind of questions we have so far. Okay, this is Myrna. Myrna is asking, okay, how do how do you know what the adjustment should be for differences, A, B, C, class, et cetera? Uh, do you have a chart or a place where we can reference for adjustments? Um, the appraiser, actually appraisers do have that, Myrna. Um, now it is going to be different area to area. So whatever, whatever they're using in, you know, say San Francisco and Burlingate, you know, just south of the Golden Gate Bridge and the, the city, um, those adjustments would be different than the, adjust, the adjustments they're using in, say, um, East Bay, you know, the, on the other side of the bay from San Francisco. So you really have to be careful what you're using for adjustments. It's, it is different by area. So, for example, um, I can tell you a general rule of thumb has always been if you do have to compare properties with different numbers of bedrooms, that you would basically assign a, an arbitrary value of $10,000 per bedroom. This is going back to the 80s. It's going to be completely different now. It might be 20 or 30,000 per bedroom now for that for that adjustment. That was like a guideline. OK, um, so that's one example. Another thing would be uh, differences in bedrooms. OK, I'm sorry. Bathrooms. Excuse me. Another same thing. Ten thousand bucks. That was it. Again, that goes back to the 80s and into the 90s. Um, you know, right now you'd have to you can actually uh, call a local appraiser and ask him for some samples or ask him for you know, what are the basic adjustments, you know, on average right now for bedrooms and bathrooms, which is the most common thing um, that, that we that we look at and, and, and concern ourselves with. You, can, you definitely have adjustments for decking, for siding, for roofing, for driveways, the size of a garage, the size of a yard, landscaping. They make adjustments for everything, Myrna, every single thing. OK. Um, and it's. I would definitely tell you that there's not going to be a uniform uh, uh, supply of information for every single area. There just there's so much difference. I mean, where where I where I'll be in this weekend up in uh, Canada, London, Ontario, is completely different than Toronto. It's only two hours away, um, but it but it's it's drastically different. So we so I would contact uh, if you know an appraiser personally, ask them if they were sure that with you. Okay. Um, Okay, let me go back and check for other questions. Uh, I think we have, uh, I think we're caught up on questions. Okay, so let's do this. Um, so Daryl, does this help you, buddy? And everybody else on the, on the webinar, does this help you uh, understand the question and how we basically answer the question? Okay, good. Um, if you, if, if, by the way, if any of you have questions, uh, can let me know, or if you feel like this was a subject that should be a different webinar, whatever your question is, 
just send an email to me and we'll we'll do a webinar just on that subject okay now what i'd like to do right now guys um is switch into a subject that's near and dear to my heart okay when i first started investing i was buying smaller properties obviously duplexes triplexes fourplexes anything in the residential world and of course i was flipping homes i eventually did start flipping larger buildings in other words you can flip uh, you can flip multi units just like you can flip a single family home it's a complete it's a it's a different strategy but the benefits are tremendous so in other words when you flip a single family home your the property is generally sitting empty while you're remodeling it and in, in fact it's bleeding red it's just money is just flowing out there's no money flowing in and all the money's flowing out okay and you have to account for that in your in your cost basis of the property and the and the basic overhead for maintaining the property while you're remodeling it gas electric water sewage taxes the whole nine yards you know um when you flip a multi-unit building there, there's a reason i want to tell you this by the way so um so hang, hang in there when you flip a multi-unit building generally speaking you're only going to be remodeling one unit at a time okay so let's say you 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 have a 12 unit building that you're going to you like to buy for the purpose of flipping for profit the good news is is if you if you remodel one unit at a time and you can spend about one month per unit throughout the year you will have remodeled all 12 units okay and each time you remodel a unit you raise the rents to the next level so the the, the whole point is obviously raise the value of the building by raising the by raising the rents in in multi-unit properties um they're appraised on something called income approach to valuation as opposed to comp comparable sales which is what daryl was asking about uh, comparable sales basically the sales comparison comparison approach does use sales of other similar properties when it, when appraisers determining value when you get to the bigger properties they will still give you that approach okay they're just not going to spend as much time on it they will also give you the cost approach to valuation what would it cost to build this building right now but the one that's most important is with multi-unit buildings is the income approach to valuation and the way you raise the income is by raising the value of the property in a physical sense in other words you improve the units put in new countertops new door and drawer fronts new carpeting new lighting fixtures more new doorknobs um fresh paint of course okay and you can then rent the property for for more money um, well, the beautiful thing about, about multi units is if you're only renting one unit at a time, that means in this example with 12 units, you've got 11 other units bringing in cash flow every single month, which generally is allowing you to not only meet your expenses, but exceed them. So you still have cash flow. You still have cash flow coming in. So you're profiting in the way of cash flow. At the end of the year or whenever you're done remodeling the building, you can then sell it for, for big profit. And remember, everything is uh, relative, so it's a factor of your cap rate. So if you buy a million dollar building and you increase the value by 20% to 1.2 million, um, you know, that's a 20% increase. In other words, if you look at the cap rate, um, you can sell that thing, you know, of course, you know, make your $200,000, but while you own it, what I'm getting at is you, you have cash flow coming in while you own it. Another thing about this is, you generally let the leases ride. So when the lease comes due on an individual unit, that's when you remodel that unit. So you don't force anybody out. Okay, you really don't have to. You can remodel the units as the leases come due. Now, some of you are in per certain parts of the country. Um, uh, Daryl, for example, all right? Perfect example. In New Jersey, um, you can't just make people leave to remodel. They have to be in agreement to, to wanting to leave a unit even if the lease uh, is up. So what you want to do is this. You want to give them plenty of notice, say in 60 days your lease is going to be up. We just want to inform you that we're going to be remodeling the unit to bring it up to code um, so that it's safe, clean, reliable, and up to code and up to current building standards. In order to do that, the unit has to be empty. We'll be more than happy to find you another unit of comparable value, okay, and comparable rents. We will help you with that process. Um, but there's the, the the type of remodeling we're going to be doing uh, requires us to have the unit to be vacant. And that's what you say. And by the way, if you know you're going to be remodeling a building, you want to put that information actually in the lease. Okay. So when they sign the lease, 
um, they are agreeing to it in advance that that's what you're going to do when your lease term is up. What I'm, the reason I'm telling you this, guys, is uh, we're now going to move into talk about commercial properties. And the reason I just gave you that that uh, story there on flipping rentals is if you look at REITs, Real Estate Investment Trusts, these are organizations that invest in real estate on behalf of other investors. So they pull together funds. It's, it's a mutual fund is what it is. They pull together funds, investment dollars from investors, and those underlying funds are used to purchase real estate instead of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Well, one of their key strategies is for a lot of successful REITs, REITs, is to do what I just described. They're just doing it on a much bigger scale. So the reason I gave you that, that the, the example of flipping multi units is learn to do it on a small scale. And later on, when you grow your business and your portfolio, you can then do it on a, a larger scale and have the experience of doing it on a smaller scale first. Basically, learn small and then grow big. OK, so. Commercial uh, the strategies for commercial. Yes, you can you can buy for the purpose of cash flow. You can buy for the purpose of capital appreciation. And you can buy for the purpose of both or multiple strategies at the same time, just like residential. OK, so what I want to do now is a uh, slide into some information related to uh, commercial. Now, this is part of of the book that just came out. It's not published yet, guys. Uh, the book is not available for public consumption, although some of you have the book. Uh, Katie has it. Uh, Tom has it. Daryl has it. Um, you got a piece of a 50 unit you know, block that we that we printed <laughs> um, just for you guys. And we really want to get your feedback, too, by the way. We, we, we want your, your opinions on the book. It's a huge book, and I, I know it's 540-something pages or something like that. Uh, but, but we are continuing to edit and make improvements on the book, and we would like your feedback, okay? Um, in any case, I want to jump into one segment tonight in the world of commercial real estate, okay? We're going to start with this, which is agents can also be investors. In fact, those of you who are on here who are agents, Every one of you that I'm aware of either is investing right now or you're planning to invest at some point in your future. Regardless, all of you at some point will evolve and grow to buy bigger properties. In other words, um, multi-unit properties, uh, not always not always residential, by the way, could be retail, could be office space, all kinds of possibilities. Right. Um, so the bottom line is this. Um, when you uh, when you first start investing, most of us are starting off in the residential area, okay? And we like that because it's relatively safe. If you're getting into land development, which is what Merlin was asking about earlier, it turns out that's actually the most risky type of investing. Development, it just it just there's lots of things that could go wrong. The economy could change, the local economy could change, interest rates could change. Um, Cost of materials could change. Just the zoning could change. All kinds of things that put. As a matter of fact, it has it right here. The most risky investment vehicles: raw land speculation. Okay, um, redevelopment's not that risky, but it still has to deal with land development. Okay. Um, now a lot of us want to invest in real estate in a way uh, that's profitable and also uh, le less risky. Um, so there actually is sort of a um, a kind of a pyramid, if you can imagine a pyramid to follow when you're investing. Generally, you start off in a residential role. A lot of residential investors actually do eventually evolve into office space because office space is usually less management intensive. Um, great return on your investment. However, office space can be more volatile, right, than residential. So uh, in any case, uh, going into residential, the beginning is usually the... Uh, safest route to go okay later on you can uh, go into the properties and of course your risk uh expands just like your profit expands remember you can gain a lot of ground by raising rent 100 unit building as opposed to raising rents on a single family home okay <laughs> so uh everything is everything's it's it's like a mathematical certainty uh, you're going to make more money the larger properties you buy. Okay, and that's one of the things I preach. Um, all right, four major property types. Um, you've got residential, office, um, retail, and industrial. Those are the four major commercial types. 
residential, office, retail, and industrial. There's other types. <clears throat> Farm and agriculture is another type, but that's generally different than commercial. Um, you know, you've also got storage, which kind of falls within loosely these one of these four categories here. But <clears throat> I will, most people that, that evolve out of residential do evolve into office space, okay? Uh, retail is actually can be very volatile in a, in a shifting economy. You know, small operations close up shop quickly. They just can't, can't keep up or they just shut their doors down and run out of business, okay? Well, the person holding the, the commercial property that's leasing the space to those small business owners is now left with a high vacancy rate, okay? So it's sort of a ripple effect there. It's like the, uh, uh, if you follow the food chain, so to speak, okay? But what I want to move into really here is what's just what I was getting to is what types of data, what types of market data that we need to make good decisions on investing, all right? Um, so this ties me back to Daryl's questions, is, which is how do I do a really good CMA on, on multi unit properties, okay? The answer is market analysis. It, it, over and above what I just described earlier, what I'm going to describe now is more relevant to, in the, to be, as a matter of fact, it is in the commercial world. OK, we definitely need market data. We need market data. Um, it's one of the most uh, fundamental things we can do to an engage in is to, number one, get the right education. Number two is get the right information. The reason we need the right education is to show us how to get the information and how to use it. OK, so market data, we got economic data, macroeconomics, microeconomics. Um, macro is the broad base. Micro is small scale, okay? You want to have data regarding a lot of, in most cases, uh, uh, employment data, okay? Employment data for whatever the industries are that are predominant in that area. So let's just talk about that for a second. Um, within the broad spectrum of employment data, you've got workforce characteristics, um, you know, the size of the population, education level, skill level, and that's going to be basically driven by the types of industry in the area is it manufacturing is it uh professional is it uh finance okay things like that um which leads us to the types of employment you know what what type of workforce do we have the labor force uh including the breakdown like we just described executive down through professional and manufacturing and skilled trades in service employees uh you definitely want to have a breakdown of that and the good news is U.S. Census.gov gives us a lot of this, and also your local taxes, I'm sorry, your local planning commission website also has much of this information, usually at the county level, often at the municipal level. Um, extremely valuable information, okay? We also want lifestyle characteristics, okay? So if you think about it, uh, we know Amazon has been looking for another site to, to build a uh, facility on. I can tell you they're not just looking at the workforce characteristics and the macro and microeconomics. They're also looking at lifestyle characteristics. Um, is the area uh, uh, suitable for things like biking, hiking, kayaking, mountain climbing, horseback riding, all those kind of neat outdoor activities? And they look at that because they want to determine, is the area going to be a big enough draw for really good employees, really good employees professional level, executive level, you know, quite frankly, they want to live in areas where their families are going to be happy to live. So they like looking for areas that have a natural draw. Now within that, remember everything's relative. So within that context, they also want to make sure that their cost of doing business there is not going to be exorbitant. In other words, the cost to live in the Bay Area is extremely expensive than the cost to live in say Nashville, Tennessee, which is a really good area right now, been up that way for a time, up and coming, strong economics, strong everything. Um, and other companies have been looking at Nashville too, a lot. Okay, it's just cheaper than the Bay Area, all right? It's cheaper than New York City. Um, so in any case, uh, uh, employers are looking at that because they want to attract good employees and they balance that with the other two factors, workforce characteristics and economic characteristics, okay? So within, Within our broad structure, we've also got um, uh, recreation opportunities like we described, 
Um, you know, Denver's been a real hot area for a while now. I mean, people are moving there in droves. And uh, we can't, it's amazing. If you've been to, haven't been to Denver lately, go to Denver. It's a, you'll be surprised at what you'll see. Okay. Um, intellectual and educational opportunities. Again, people want to be around great colleges and universities. So when their children grow up, they've got a great place to go to school. Um, they also look at cultural trends and values. So what's interesting is I've been to over 500 cities, towns in the last three years. I can tell you every place has something of value. Every place has something uh, to draw people in, some on a large scale, some on a small scale. But I always research an area before I go to it because I want to have fun. I want to go do what's what's available to do in the area. So, for example, a place like um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I lived there for two decades. You wouldn't think it's real strong culturally, but it is. They've got a, they've got a strong um, ethnic mixture there, mostly old, old world European. Uh, but they've got great college universities there. They got a great medical uh, provider system there. Uh, World class hospitals. They got great sports teams. Um, you're not close to the ocean, so I will give you that. But they are close to skiing, snow skiing, um, a lot of other great outdoor activities. Right? Great, great area. It's been, it's been ranked a lot of times one of the best areas to raise a family. All right. So don't be surprised at what you might find in different areas. It's not always places like New York City in San Francisco that have the big cultural draws. There's areas you might not have previously considered, okay? Um, you know, they mentioned here Laguna Beach, California, Santa Fe, New Mexico, are known as artist communities. I've been to both, and I love both of them. I really like Laguna Beach, by the way. Um, so, uh, in any case, um, uh, by the way, they have a festival there called the Sawdust Festival every August in Laguna Beach. It's awesome. If you ever get to go, go do that in the morning. Go play beach volleyball in the afternoon. And uh, maybe go have dinner at night. It's a great place to go. But in any case, community identity. What is the community known for? What's What do people think of when they think of Laguna Beach? What do people think of when they think of Chicago? Okay. Um, that, that's important. So then you got also, by the way, your psychographics and your demographics. Okay. Um, marketers use this stuff, by the way. They use psychographics to determine. Uh, what type of ads um, are they going to be placing in the local papers, on the local TV, local radio um, to sell products and services? Um, they also are looking for emerging trends, things like that, um, because it helps them determine what types of services to offer there. Like, did we put in another McDonald's or did we put in, you know, uh, Chick-fil-A or do we put in, uh, Olive Garden, or do, do we need another Starbucks? Good Lord, I think I've literally seen some cities where on the same city block, there's two Starbucks on the same block. I, I, good Lord, you know, I've even seen, I was on a cruise about a month ago. There was a Starbucks on the cruise, okay? <laughs> on the cruise ship, excuse me, as well as the Ben and Jerry's ice cream, by the way. Kate, that's right, Kate was there. So, uh, in any case, uh, psychographics, it tells us um, what what we believe is going to be needed in the area in the way of uh, services and products and things like that. Um, demographics really is a study of the of the population. Um, everything, age, sex, income, all that stuff become, falls under the, the the basic category of demographics. Okay. Um, comparables. Uh, let's just switch gears here for a second. We've talked about the underlying characteristics of an area. Um, that's important to people who invest in commercial properties. Uh, now we're going to get back to what Daryl first started this whole thing off with, which is comparables. But before I do, let me check for questions because we just gave you quite a, a, a handful there. Um, um, let's see. Let's see. Ryan, this is, or Myrna. Hey, Myrna. Um, they are building in Fresno. Yeah, Myrna, you know what's amazing? Um, that whole Central Valley area, man, it's, it's been, it's been pretty good. And it's been like the unsung hero. So if you go down to like Bakersfield and then go up North through, um, uh, Fresno and, um, where else did I teach there? Central Valley? Can't believe I'm drawing a blank. Myrna, help me out. I just taught there back in December. Um, I can't believe I can't remember the name. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, of course, West of, um, Yosemite. 
and along that Central Valley corridor, um, not quite up to like uh, Stockton, not that far north. Um, can't believe see what happens in turn 29, guys. You can't remember things <laughs> like places you've been. Um, uh, any case, uh, Elk Grove, not that, no, Joyce, not that far north. This is down, it's sort of like Fresno, um, sort of like Bakersfield, and right along that corridor. And I can't remember if Fresno was a beloved it, above it or below it. Um, the funny thing is, I'll probably remember this as soon as we're done with the webinar, and then I'll have to email you guys. In any case, back to this. Um, comparables. When you're investing in commercial properties, we still do appraisals. We still do comparables, just like Daryl was asking about. Um, what we're looking for is building data, like I described before, the physical characteristics of the building. Okay, We're looking for rental data. I didn't necessarily mention that specifically, but it's kind of implied. Um, what are the units being rented for? Okay, what is being offered in the in the buildings? Do we offer off street parking? Do we offer storage? Do we offer laundry? Um, a security system, twenty four hour management. Um, what about things that maybe not be necessary in some areas like heating and air conditioning? There's parts of California where I can tell you they don't have uh, air conditioning at all, right? I've been parts of in homes in California where they don't have central heat. Okay, if you can imagine that. Um, what about community services? Um, you know, there's if you think about it, really areas that have a really big draw. It's not always about the culture, like like the music, the music venues, the you know plays, the, all the cultural stuff. Sometimes it has to do with public transportation in the proximity of shopping and other services, right? like medical facilities, uh, things like that. Transportation um, are huge, the bigger the bigger the areas, right? Uh, really important when, you're, when it comes to uh, uh, valuing property. All right, now let's just focus real quick on a little bit of uh, residential type of properties. And if we have time, we'll get in there to some office space, okay? All right, within the world of residential, uh, commercial, which is five units and above, you generally got garden, which is your flats. So basically, everything is on the first floor. You've got mid-rise. And by the way, garden can also be, um, in some areas, I've seen them consider anything up to and including three units, garden apartments. Generally, people frown on that. I mean, usually it's ground level or maybe maybe two stories, right? Mid-rise and high-rise. High-rise, of course, is like, you know, Toronto, Chicago, New York. Um, big cities like that have have buildings that are 20 to you know 60 and more stories. Mid rise is generally going to be like somewhere you know five to, to 12 stories, something like that. Okay. Um, all right, garden apartments, garden units. You're generally going to find um, in suburban areas. Okay, uh, where land is less expensive because they take up more space. They generally have their own little yard space, little gardening space, things like that. Okay. Uh, Mid-rise, uh, usually you're going to find in the outlying areas of the urban areas, okay, call them the suburbs or in the urban areas, um, they usually have, uh, they're still have their own individual utilities, okay, uh, everybody pays their own bills, gas and electric, things like that. Um, sometimes they'll have common areas like a lobby, recreation, swimming pool, tennis courts, uh, exercise room. These are properties, okay? They don't have to be necessarily A or grade A properties. They can certainly be B and C properties. Uh, they just may be older, but they still have these amenities, okay? Um, okay, that's mid-rise. High-rise is the big stuff, okay? Um, you, again, you're gonna generally find these in the major um, urban area, right? Uh, and there's lots of examples. We just gave a couple of them. Look at, by the way, look at Miami now. Good, my God. If, Miami, if you fly in or drive in, you're going to see loads and loads of, of cranes, construction cranes. And look at what they're building. They're building high rises. In fact, the joke is in Miami that now the Miami flower is the is the is the construction crane because <laughs> there's so many of them. Um, in any case, there's other things like like the smaller stuff. You know, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. Again, they're generally they're they're by definition fall into residential, not commercial. However, you can get commercial loans on these properties, okay? Just because something is four units or less doesn't mean you have to get a 
a traditional residential mortgage. You can get a commercial mortgage on these properties, no doubt about it. Um, as long as it's not owner occupied, they'll let you do that. And you also you can get conventional mortgages too. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, classifications. This is important. Uh, we're going to probably get into this, guys, and then we'll call it we'll call it a day because to get into other subjects, it's going to take way too much time, and I don't want to start on something that we can't finish. Uh, but I want to I want to go over this, and then we'll open up for more questions. Um, first things first, uh, we use these because this is what lenders use to, when they look at properties that that they are going to be lending money on. We're asking them to make a loan on a property, where they grade them based on these cl these classes right here. Okay, class A, which is basically new, newer institutional grade. This is the good stuff, man. This is like, um, you know, Trump Towers, for example. He's got buildings in Chicago and New York and other places. Um, he likes to build new. He likes to, to basically reclaim and build, build brand new. And if you ask him, he'll tell you, you build the nicest place with the nicest material, the nicest design in the nicest area. People will knock down your door to get in those places, and he is right. Okay, um, that's a B is good, high grade institutional, but they've generally been around for more than a generation or two, so they're basically class B because they're older. Uh, class C and D are generally the um, you know been around for a while. It's not that they're bad; um, they just are dated. I mean, everything the construction is old, old style construction, old style materials. Um, they may even upgrade the windows, for example, but the, the room sizes are still smaller. The walls are thinner. The doors are old style. The, the flooring, um, they don't have as many amenities, things like that. And then the, the D stuff, we generally don't really want to kind of mess with, okay? Um, but those are the basic classifications. Um, if you're ever interested in learning more about this, I, I used to belong to the apartment association where I live. Uh, there is an institute called Institute of Real Estate Management, IREM, okay? Um, and they give you a lot of education and training in this area. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Um, in fact, let's go ahead and wrap it up at this point. Uh, property and ownership characteristics. We'll, we'll do that on, on another day because um, that would be a much bigger subject. Um, but just remember this, IREM, you can Google it and look it up. And there's a lot of information that they will give you for free. Uh, you can also look up your own local apartment association, and they'll have lots of valuable information also that you can get. Even NAR, National Association of Realtors. Uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, REIA, R-E-I-A, Real Estate Investors of America, um, has a website you can use. Um, in fact, I just looked at this the other day. Uh, Let's see if I can find it here. Hang on one second. Um, I'm going to draw it a link. I just wrote this down. In any case, I think it's called. Uh, oh, here it is. Real Estate Investing Today. Real Estate Investing Today dot com. Um, gives you daily updates in the marketplace on investment real estate. You can get lots of good information there, too. Um, in any case, let me check for questions here, guys, before we. Call it a day. Uh, let's see. Well, we got a bunch of them. Okay. Um, okay, guys, give me a second to go back to where we left off. Okay, this is Tom Slater back. Hey, Tom. Uh, let's see. I looked at a $4.2 million listing. Daryl mentioned earlier with my investor used the rental calculator and came up with a price range that I discussed with my investor and then the seller's agent. My investor decided not to move forward because of the number of units in the community. There were 250 units in the development and the investment block was 26 units. He would not have the votes to control the association's decisions on expenditures for the community. Consequently, no deal, no problem, we'll find another one. Well, Tom, I appreciate your, your attitude. So I remember you telling me about that guy. He wants to uh, have controlling interest in voting. It, in other words, there's obviously an association there. Um, and you will see that in a lot of developments, but not every development is is part of a, um, 
uh, they don't have a owner's association, for example, okay? It's not a condo or they don't have an HOA. But when they do, um, you know, smaller investors really won't care. They'll, they'll go with it. If it's a good deal, it's a good deal. They just know that over time, the association may raise fees or dues, and there's not much they can do about it except cast or vote, okay? Um, let's see, Myrna, or PUDs, good investments. Planning unit developments, yeah. Um, so, Myrna, um, PUDs actually started back around 100 years ago, okay? Plan unit development. So in other words, um, the local powers that be decided we're going to actually plan a city or a town. A lot of them started in California, by the way. Um, however, you see on the East Coast more and more going back to the 60s. Columbia, Maryland is a perfect example. Columbia, Maryland, I used to live, is a PUD, plan unit development. Um, I do like them. Uh, generally speaking, the person that makes the most money is the person that gets in the earliest. So the, the old adage, the early bird gets the worm. So Myrna, if you can be in on the ground floor of a PUD, um, kudos to you because generally speaking, you'll make the most money. Now, over time, what happens is once it goes through, it's, it matures and it's become seasoned and the development slows down, the resale market will kick in. And they also, by the way, um, you'll notice in PUDs, they have a mixture of single family homes and multi unit properties. And they build what, what we call villages, villages of town center or a neighborhood center with uh, basically a strip mall and around that are all the residential units okay and they'll put the multi-units near public transportation uh, things like that so what i'm getting at is over time um, uh, some areas will be great for resale for flipping for example and some will be great for for the rental business you just have to use your your analysis tools we give you to determine which way it's going which way it's going um in any case uh this is from Mio. Hey, Mio, how you doing? Uh, hey, Gary, I am shopping for my client office building, prefer medical doctor's office. My investor's friend told not to use LoopNet CoStar because they are leftover listings. I call other brokers if they have any listings, any other efficient way to find a property. Mio, perfect question. We just talked about this today, Miho, in the class I taught. In today's economy, um, yeah, you don't want to use the MLS. You don't want to use CoStar Loop. I mean, I'm sorry. You want to use them sparingly. That's that's a very limited source of inventory. So, Miho, what we generally do is we create the opportunities by using like the letter campaign, for example, to go under the radar screen. What I mean is, is um, uh, using the tools like your you can find out who owns the properties. Let's say you guys looking for the, the uh, an office space that's medical office space. You can find out who owns the properties by going to your tax assessor's database. You can also use uh, Rebo Gateway in your area, by the way. Um, more importantly, um, we can find out who the owners are. And if it's an LLC or a corporation, you can go to your state's Bureau of Incorporation and find out who actually you know, initiated or launched the, the, the corporation. You then send them the, the letter, Miho, the letter that, remember, there's two letters. One is branded and one is unbranded. The branded one is the one you want to use for larger, more professional commercial space. It's branded. It's got a heading. Um, it's got a letter head and it's just more, uh, basically more, uh, more business-like. The other one is what we call the unbranded letter, and that's the one you send to smaller outfits, small operations, a, a elderly couple owning a duplex, for example. OK, you use the letter, the unbranded letter for those folks. So, so Miho, if you look at um, go to myinvestorservices.com, click on the members area and then log into silver level. Go down on the left hand side on your panel of resources, go to the towards the bottom where it says uh, marketing tools and techniques and other resources in there is going to be the letter that we use to send to the more professional letter. All right. And then if you, um, if you watch a webinar, I think it's uh, January 27th of 2016. So it'll say 2016 dash zero one dash two seven. That one describes how you actually use the letter. Okay. And Mio, if you want to email me, I'll send you the checklist also on how to use the letter. But you want to use that, Miho, because 
uh, people, a lot of agents will say, well, there's nothing available out there. That does just because something's not for sale, not actively marketed or advertised, doesn't mean they're not for sale. Every property is for sale. You just have to create your opportunity by approaching them with something like the letter. So, Mio, you know, that's what we do. We, we uh, instead of waiting for the opportunities in this type of market, we have to go and create the opportunities. Okay, and that letter is one of the best ways to do it. So, uh, by the way, keep me posted on that one. That could be a nice payday for you. Um, okay, guys. That's pretty much it for me for tonight. Um, uh, great subject. I'm glad you guys were asking about this because we very rarely talk about commercial. And it's been coming up a lot lately, probably because there's more conversations around getting rental properties. So we will see you all next week. Next week, by the way, is going to be on the 3rd, Tuesday night. We had moved it from Wednesday night to, to, to Tuesday night, the night before. Um, We'll see you then, and uh, let me know what you want to talk about, guys. Give me give me your ideas, what subjects you want to discuss, and we will um, go over that on the next webinar. Sometimes we got to table it for a week or two. Oh, by the way, the end of April, April 24th, uh, we have a special guest coming on to talk about tax lien certificates. Um, I've, I've got content on that for all 50 states, but he's going to give you some of his strategies. So just remember the 24th tax lien certificates and uh in between there we'll talk about our own our own subject so god bless you all i hope you have a great night i will see you next week okay take care guys bye, -bye.